type of legal risk on that? Well, I would hate to give you the, a lawyerly answer. Um, you know, I can't stop anybody from, from suing, but I can, I can tell you what, what the case law is out there is that, and there's a, a pretty strong case from the Circuit Court of Cook County that uh, it wasn't with, it was, it was, the case was over a town's actual video gaming license, not even a liquor license. And in that case, uh, the court found that the village's home rule authority, they, they had the power to do that. They, they supported the village's position to go above and beyond what is said in the uh, Illinois Video Gaming Act. Secondly, uh, there is no specific uh, uh, restriction on home rule authority in the Illinois Video Gaming Act. That's another thing that you'd, you'd look for in state statutes where, uh, you know, I, my opinion as a municipal attorney, home, home rule authority is plenary unless uh, the state has told us otherwise. They have not done so here. Now here we're dealing with liquor and the liquor or we're, we're that's what we're amending, our liquor code, and there's plenty of case law that establishes the right of the board to not only define and interpret their classifications, but to set numbers for them. So there is precedent, I guess, for, for this action. Could somebody challenge it? I, theoretically, yes. Yeah, um, I, just but, for, yeah. I was asking because going through and reading through the state gaming yeah. law, there was nothing Correct. specific to this type of an ordinance, and I didn't know if we had, it, did, Mr. Seaman, if you had heard that from any other villages that have done this, or? I think there's a lot of uh, flexibility here. You know, once the decision is made to allow it, the village is, you know, because the village can disallow them too. I mean, that's the other extreme. So I, I think you're given a lot of free uh, okay. reign. Perfect. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you, sir. Yes. Hi. I just want to thank you and the board for actually considering this ordinance. I know when I first started attending these village board meetings, this was one of the hot button issues that everybody was very passionate about was video gaming, video gaming licenses. So for those individuals in the crowd who don't think you're listening, here's an example that shows that you are. Um, this seems like a, actually a very effective compromise. I mean, I love the fact that you're extending from the 100 feet that you were saying is the minimum to 500 feet from schools and various organizations that may not appreciate video gaming licenses. That in itself will limit the number of licenses you can actually you know, eventually you're going to run out of land, so that limits the number of permits you can possibly do by having that particular thing. So I, I strongly encourage the board to consider the mayor's request on this. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Tom Pavlopoulos. I'm the owner of Parkside Plaza on 167th and 80th Avenue. Um, we've been uh, the owners of that plaza since 1987. Um, we've tried to be good stewards of the plaza, to be good community uh, participants, and our plaza is considered a, a, B, a B category plaza as opposed to an A category plaza. For those of us who don't really know the difference between the two, an, an A category plaza are the Harlem Avenues and 159th Streets that cater to the high traffic areas. Uh, our plaza, 167th and 80th Avenue, if you looked at it from the 5,000 foot view, is a, right in the middle of a highly dense residential area of Tinley Park uh, from 159th to uh, uh, 187th or 191st, from LaGrange to Harlem. It's all residential homes. Um, our plaza has been uh, struggling over the years for many reasons. We have a lot of vacancies. Uh, we still maintain the plaza. We still work very hard to uh, keep a good presence and a clean presence. Uh, I've had several tenants over the years, the Tinley Park Markets and, and, and such, who have come to the board for liquor licenses, for packaged liquor licenses, and have been denied. And, the repercussions of that denial is those businesses have gone out of business. And I've got heavy vacancies, and a lot of us in these little plazas have heavy vacancies. And, and we're there to cater to the local community. We're there to, to cater to the, to the te, uh, residents of Tinley Park who are the immediate. We're not looking to cater to the guys who are driving from point A to point B. Uh, we're serving the local residents of Tinley Park. Um, 
this 500 foot uh, restriction, what would do to me, just so, and, and I don't wanna sound selfish, but I wanna bring out some points to you, all of you because there's other people who will be adversely affected as I am, uh, is I currently have a potential tenant who wants to put a gaming cafe in my plaza. We are sacrificing rent, we are sacrificing um, space to accommodate this very qualified tenant who actually exceeds all of the current, all of the current requirements that are uh, stated by the highly regarded gaming board of the state of Illinois. Because the, the gaming board of the state of, state of Illinois uh, works very diligently and, and it's not a static gaming board. If, if they felt that there were issues with 100 square feet, which is what the gaming board of the state of Illinois uh, recommends and what's, what it, what it uh, expresses as being uh, what uh, should be the proper distance between a church or a school, 100 feet, uh, if they felt that there was uh, issues with that, they would have no problem changing it. Uh, in my studies of gaming cafes, they're getting uh, monthly uh, revisions of laws and, uh, and statutes that they have to modify or, or, or abide by that maybe last month they didn't have to. So uh, the gaming board of the state of Illinois uh, spends a lot of time and has a lot of effort in making sure that whatever they express as being the law uh, is, supportive of social and economic benefits to all their communities. So having said that, I, I really want to uh, express my uh, concern with you wanting to change 500, square, uh, 500 feet away from a school or a church, because it would basically eliminate my whole plaza from any gaming, whether it was the existing restaurant or this gaming cafe. And the gaming cafe that we're talking about, you guys have all seen the layout. It's not a seedy place whatsoever. It's going to be a very streamlined, modern, clean gaming facility that's going to cater to people who are looking for that type of entertainment. Um, I'm a father of four boys, so believe me, when it comes to uh, social responsibility and uh, expressing uh, having a, a community that's going to uh, positively impact our, our, our children. Uh, as a father of four, believe me, I, I, I stand behind all of you when it comes to doing that. But um, I really would like you to focus on what are you trying to accomplish with this 500 foot restriction? What are you really trying to accomplish? Because uh, as of this weekend, I, I happened to go through some places in Tinley Park, and I'm going to give you a, a packet of pictures. This picture is of a typical establishment. It's not just one. It's, I have a list here of all the licensees of Tinley Park, and it includes Centennial Lanes Bowling Alley, Ed and Joe's Restaurant, uh, Tinley Park Fajita Mexican Restaurant, Nick's Barbecue, which is, happens to be what I'm going to show you pictures of right now. And I'm going to, if I may, can I approach and drop this up to you for you? Please, time? please do. Thank you. What you're going to see in these pictures is you walk into Nick's Barbecue and you walk up to the counter and you look to your left and there is a very thin strap like you see at the airport and there's five gaming machines sitting there, one of which is a Playboy gaming machine. So when that person leaves church, okay, you're, you're, you're saying that you know, churches should be 500 feet away. But what about that family that leaves church, goes to Nick's Barbecue for lunch, sits down at the booth and looks up, and there's five players playing video games there. And the kids say, Dad, can I go play those video games? No, those are not for you. What we're saying is having a dedicated gaming cafe. If you want to do the right thing, make it 21 or over. 
make it 21 or over. That way the people who are seeking that type of gaming entertainment know where to go. And people with children, there's nowhere to be seen. I mean, right now you're having people walk into a place who are not seeking any gaming exposure. They're going to buy a hot dog or they're going to buy a gyros or a beef sandwich. And they sit down at the booth with their kids and they see five guys sitting at, a, at five games playing video games, playing, playing, uh, you know, slots. So my concern is that there is a way to do the social correct thing. I'm not sure 500 feet is going to change the way people look at that. Um, we want to put a classy facility that is dedicated strictly to gaming, people who are seeking gaming entertainment. And I want you to consider what I've just said and understand that if this law goes through, it uh, adversely uh, affects my plaza and its value. And I'm not 100% sure what the legality is. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. But if the Gaming uh, Commission of the state of Illinois feels 100 feet is appropriate, I would urge Tilly Park to agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. I suspect that this is largely a degree as to how you measure from place to place. And I don't know, for instance, if the entrance to your particular video gaming hall is it would be designated here. Um, but portal to portal, I guess, is what I'm trying to, I don't know how they do it. Wall to wall is, is, is one way to, you know, I mean, I'll defer to council in terms of how those. What is what is it currently? Well, if you go, it's 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 bad. It, but what it abuts we, the property it? line, so it's right. Does. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I don't know how the state does. I really don't. I don't know how they do it. But is it? Are we as a home rule? Can't we? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I, I think it's feet. clearly defined inside the uh, uh, Illinois gaming uh, law. I believe it's from the closest corner of a church building is how it's measured for the churches. Now for schools and everything else, I believe it's portal, but for churches, it's the closest point, point. of the outside of the building. But uh -huh. to what though? Like corner of the church to what part of this to, gentleman's to building? Wherever his front the door, structure is, that, his back I door? His. I mean, that's the, that's the issue, right? He, well, yeah. We don't his, know where to measure to. It, I, I think that... It, I actually have it here. Would you like to see it? Well, if you'd share it with council, I think yeah, that might help. Yeah, please share it with the counselor. And then I guess the second question to that would be then, as a home rule, are we allowed to implement our own? I think it's the language that we're, we're interested in. Oh, that's yeah, the if it's in the statute, it's it's in the statute. That's the, for the hundred feet. I, I get. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons we talked this through committees. You know, one of the main concerns on the distance was between each other. That that's not addressed in the video gaming act. You know, from store to store, so that you might not see. Uh, you know five of them within one on one block or within one sure. uh, community if you know if, if you wanted to go with the the state law to what they currently define that's something you could but do it was discussed to discuss the closeness to a church and to a school i mean we uh, i also made a point of making that you know a heavy part of our conversation i, I guess it, at the end of the day 500 feet it is but is that from the front i need to know is that from a front door to a front door of a church or as one of the residents stated, is that going to be yeah. to the corner of the church? You know, I, I, I think there needs to be a little thought put into it. I don't yeah. see that to delay this vote, but I'd like to know that for the future. Between the respective close of points of the outer walls of the structure containing the licensed video game and the place of worship. Um, so it could be the and rear, maybe that hallway could be the rear of the building. That, it, that's not, sorry, let me, let me retract that. I don't have the code in front of me, but there is a defined way to measure it in the code, I guess. That's... It, uh, you know, if that's in there, that's 
that's what we should follow. And as a home rule, are we allowed to implement our own measure? I would say yes. Thank you. So maybe part of the secondary discussion of this uh, amendment to the liquor uh, license we discussed uh, zoning districts for these yes. video gambling. This this may be part of the secondary discussion if there's a way that we can implement a tool to do this measuring. If I may ask, if my applicant has already had an application in, is he governed by the new rule or is he grandfathered in based on the old requirements? He doesn't have a liquor license. Yeah, he doesn't have a liquor license right now. Right now. He doesn't have a liquor license, so. Not that I'm aware of. He's subject to the new. Correct. If it passes, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, just like zoning, the liquor licenses and the gaming, I think are going to be, the denial of those are going to be putting hardships on certain people. I think there's gaming establishments that people personally don't like. I made this suggestion before, and I'm going to ask some trustee to possibly consider it and ask the village attorney or do, do it in some meeting. You know, with all due respect to you, Mayor, you handle the liquor licenses on your own. Now, the only place that I could find that has a liquor commission that's a home rule community is Huntley, Illinois, and they passed an ordinance where the village board was made the liquor commission, so there was input from all the members of the village board. I think as a home rule community, this town has the power to create a liquor commission so that all these individual things could be brought in where the people against could have their say, where the people for could have their say. And just like people need zoning variances for fences or swimming pools or changing a driveway one way or the other, so that these can all be taken into consideration individually for the best interests of the town and our merchants and our people. Thank you. Um, we've got this item up for adoption. We've got a, a, a specific situation where there would be some um, difficulty to one particular petitioner. I think that we should proceed with this ordinance and if we need to revisit and tweak it, we revisit and tweak it. I don't think that it's uh, a permanent uh, situation. Ordinances are written in paper to, for that very reason. So I, I would strongly recommend to the board that it pass it as it is and then we um, see which situations come up. I think that we've got one in hand right now that we reconsider. We can reconsider the, I think we look at the legal limit, which is the 100, and maybe we get flexible, but we obviously cannot abrogate or go less than the state standard. That it's simply not in within our uh, uh, purview to do that. So um, we're, we're, you know, bound by, by their rules as well. So this point, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Item 31, roll call on waiver of first reading for ordinance 045, Trustee Maher. Yay. Trustee Grady. Yay. Trustee Panito. Yes. Trustee Vandenberg. Yes. Trustee Yunker. Yay. Trustee Suggs. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. At this time, I would like to ask for a concurring motion to adopt ordinance number 2016-0-27, amending Title 11, Chapter 112, Section 112.22 of the Tinley Park Municipal Code, addition of one additional Class E liquor license for Blaze Pizza. This is not for video gaming. May I have a concurring motion, please? So, I have a second. Second. Thank you. Um, this item is up for adoption. As you know, Blaze Pizza just opened up a few days ago, um, and they're interested in selling beer and wine. No video gaming. I, I just have a question. Why are we waiving first reading on this one? We're not. Oh. This was this was written. This was uh, done first reading last time. This is adoption. Anybody on the board have any questions about this? Anybody from the public here to comment? Yes, sir. 
Was this just for a liquor license? Or yes, did you, sir. Did you also add gaming to it? No gaming. They would get the regular license without a V. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Can I just, can I just check one thing? So item 31 passed, so now we've got the two licenses, correct? Yes. And this is applying for the first license, right? Correct, the, without the, the V designation, yes. I wanted to make sure that 31 is passed. I didn't hear the vote for that part. Yes. If no other questions, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> Item 32, Ordinance 027, and final, so roll call. Trustee Maher. Yay. Trustee Grady. Yay. Trustee Panito. Yes. Trustee Vandenberg. Yes. Trustee Yunker. Yes. Trustee Suggs. Yes. Motion carries. Item number 33, uh, I would like to ask for a concurring motion to Ordinance number 2016-0-38, amending Title 11, Chapter 112, Section 112.22 of the Tinley Park Municipal Code, addition of one additional uh, Class E liquor license for Noodles and Company. <laughs> May I have a concurring motion, please? So moved. Thank you. A second. Second. Thank you. Um, this is for Noodles and Company. They are not requesting any video gaming, and uh, they would be the recipient of a Class E liquor license, beer and wine. Uh, this is for first reading. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 34, comments from board and staff. I'll make a comment there. Please. There's been a lot of discussion this evening about staff, and I'd just like to take the opportunity to point one out specifically. Um, today is Lisa Valley's birthday, and she is actually in attendance this evening, so she's going above and beyond her duties as, as the village administrative assistant to the village manager and to the village trustees. So I'd just like to thank her for coming out this evening and spending this uh, beautiful night and on her birthday here at the village uh, meeting. So happy birthday. It is also Steve Clemmer's birthday, who was here a little earlier. I don't know if he's still here, but there he is. Oh, yeah, Steve Another Clemmer. birthday boy. That. Yeah, Steve. So there's two dedicated staff members of the village of Tinley Park. And there was somebody else that had a birthday, her, I hear, somewhere. No, we're not going to sing happy birthday. Don't worry, you're safe. Any other uh, comments from the board? Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, TJ. The EMA director just wanted me to make a, a statement in regards to the... Uh, direct uh, uh, the, the, the chance of severe weather tomorrow and just make sure it's out there that we're supposed to get hit with some nasty storms early in the day and then later in the day. Well, there's a moderate right. risk of tornadoes is what they put out as well, um, which is the highest we've had in two years. I'd also like to, um, there was a point that was raised earlier about the um, TIF 101 meeting that we wanted to convene to be able to to get people fully informed we think it's important that everybody understands all the implications ramifications rationale as to why and or why not that that the, the tiff was recommended here because believe me the board debated this as well this was not oh yeah let's just do it um so that tiff 101 section that we suggested be prior to another meeting uh, my, my only reason for why we talk about prior to another meeting is because I can assure a quorum to open a public meeting I have to have a quorum and if I don't have a quorum I have to cancel the public meeting so to have everybody here and not to have a quorum it's one thing now conversely we could do a committee meeting which has a little bit different standard to just need two of the three members so if uh, we can get the board to you know if an op another date prior to July 5th is possible um, I'd ask staff to poll the board and to see if we can't get another date that would work and, you know, probably just do it at Carlson Center. I don't know if it's going to get a lot of attention, but, um, or it is, I'll defer to the clerk's office on the location side, but to basically make this presentation and if it's uh, done in an open meeting format and if it's done as a committee meeting, it would just take two of the six trustees to be in attendance to, you know, to hold it in that way, I think. Um, public question could be, you know, addressed. Um, there's, there's, there. I don't think there's a rush. I think the the trouble with the um, development process in general is that it takes time to get things moving, 
and understand we've got other projects to be developed in downtown that are really dependent upon that TIF uh, detention pond being built. There's also some MWRD requirements, and Jennifer probably can tell us that, that are pretty tight, and we're right on the border of that now. So if we don't get those permits pulled, we're going to be subjected to even worse standards. So that's that's why the, the rush. It's it's not a rush because we're just trying to to you know plow it through. It's just because we're constrained by a number of other uh, issues. Well, it depends which issues you feel important. If downtown development is important, you want that done. If it's not important to you, then you don't. That's really the long and short of it. Any other questions from the board? Any questions from staff? At this point, you're, all, you're on, sir. The public comment only speaks as your one, right? When we speak during the items, that doesn't count? That would not, that would not count. Okay. The way it's currently written, it's the, the chair can take comments at any time. So that would not count. Thank you. Public comment. Um, First one, I don't know if this is a question for the treasurer, uh, Mr. Bentenhausen, or if this is for Mr. Seaman. Ivan Baker, who is leaving in July, was hired in October of 2003, and he gets 35 paid days off per year. Now with him, leaving since your days your 35 days are per year you work they're not you don't work a year and then get the 35 days I just want to make sure that since he's leaving before his year is up that will these 35 days be prorated and to check that there won't be any days that are given for the next fiscal year I mean, I'll defer to the treasurer's office. I'm not certain of the accrual basis that the village uses for staff payroll. I would imagine it's, uh, is, is it accrued by pay period? I can't hear. It's, I mean, he'll, we have to pay vacation days on what's, what he still has. His remaining. balances. I, I, I don't yes, know what, what I'm that saying is for the appointments. Yeah. Start May 1st, he won't get 35 more days, and then when he retires, or retires when he leaves, we'll do a FOIA and find out that he got an $18,000 vacation check. <laughs> the days, the days are, uh, are controlled by the personnel manual. They are accrued on a monthly basis. So, so he, he will not get a 35-day allotment all, of, all at once. There's well, not a front-end load. It's no, there's no front end. Thank you. Yeah, because okay, I mean, I, I've dealt with payroll systems that work that way. So the 35 days would be prorated over, let's just say, 10 months or whatever One it is. month or two months or Correct. whatever he worked. Yeah, because he's a couple months short of that. Yeah, wouldn't, N.A. Okay. And um, Mr. Mayor, has there been any updates? I forget what it was, maybe a year and a half or so ago, um, about the... Uh, pensions for the firemen not being paid in the, the IRMF? Have we settled that issue? Are they? I believe there's no pending Is there going to be any money that we owe later? Or? I don't believe there's any liabilities on the normal pension liabilities yeah, for those right. that are, sure, treasurer, divert. He's the IMRF rep too. He's, oh, okay, that's even better. Busy day for you, Brad. Uh, that is an issue that has been, uh, I believe, distorted uh, by some individuals. But the, I, we, the I, IMRF uh, came in and did an audit of our payroll, and they determined that our firefighters, part-time firefighters, were eligible for IMRF while they had made a change in the employer manual that for, for many, many years was contrary to what they told us at following the audit, we were required to enroll the eligible firefighters into the IMRF fund. We did that. They are now eligible for retirement benefits if they meet the, the hourly qualifications. And if some of some of those individuals had prior years of service, if they re, if they requested to purchase that prior service, the 
the village's cost of that actuarial funding requirement will be added to our uh, rates in future years. So when you distorted by individuals within your staff or? It's distorted that, we, that there's a liability that we owe that we haven't paid. That is not true. I know distorted by who are you, what are you speaking? I don't understand. You guys distorted, you had a misunderstanding of how it was supposed to be paid or? We have, en we've enrolled the firefighters. We are, they are, they're having their employee, employee contribution withheld. We are, we are paying our employer contribution uh, on, on the pay as, it, as we go along. If they opted to purchase prior service that they were qualified for, then that IMRF rules puts that into our future uh, employer rate. So there is no back liability that we have not paid that we have been told that we owed. Okay, so it was all paid into correctly? It, correct. Okay, thanks. And then um, the, the defined merit pay scale, do you have anything to do with that, Mr. Benhauser, or is that just through the uh, no. upper management? What's, what's the question with that? Um, the question I have is the, the pay scale in 2013 for, um, I hate saying names, for one of the staff members was 131,000, then the year they were hired, all of a sudden that pay for that, Mr. Seaman mentioned that we never bring anyone in at um, more than midpoint, you said last meeting, mid-range, midpoint. The mid-range for uh, the manager would be 131,000. That's mid-range. And the highest he would be paid would be 152,000. When Mr. Neheis left to Lombard, he was paid 148,000. Then as soon as we made this appointment, you guys changed the, the pay scale, and that went up. $38,000 in one year from your mid-range. So that basically then is not true. You have paid people above and at the top of the pay scale. Because at the pay scale mid-range, as you stated, was 131000 And then after the appointments, it went up 38000 The village board re reviewed with the consultant that made the uh, recruiting about what the market was and the change was reflective of the market for somebody with the experience that the person that was hired had. So that Mr. Niehuis was underpaid? I, I don't think that equal pay necessarily means equal skills or equal experience or equal talent. This because no other pay line item went up like that, but this one that you specifically mentioned that you never pay at the top of their pay scale went up $38,000. And that just goes back to what- it was um, a board decision. Mrs. Cunningham was speaking about earlier that it's our money and you just, 38,000, there it is. And then all you do is you adjust the line items, then you actually can say that you did put the person in at mid-level because then it'll match your new numbers. It was a board decision. Not an individual decision, it was a board decision. Did you vote yes? I'm sure I did. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> My name is Mike Stuckley, I've been a resident for 49 years. And uh, right here, I hold in my hand a gesture of civic and meritorious services signed by Mayor Zabraki and, and Clerk Frank German. He recognizes me as the head coach responsible for bringing the first Illinois Kids Wrestling Federation State Championship to Tinley Park, year 1983. I was only 23. Now you can't get this kind of merit and notoriety without being good, working with people of all ages. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about people. Mr. Mayor and esteemed board members, as a very productive member of the Citizens of Tinley Park Public Face Group, 
would have been removed for voicing my opinion about a member that was also removed because this gentleman dared to disagree on a site with mural appointee Ken Shaw. Mr. Mayor and trustees, Citizens of Tamley Park is nothing but a political hack organization. Citizens of Tinley Park public censors its members for pub publicly laying out personal convictions if those convictions are deemed controversial or unorthodox. Citizens of Tinley Park public encourages re ridiculing those same members through personal remarks derogatory in nature. Citizens of Tinley Park public restricts the ability of users to express differing political views and move, removes their users' memberships for voicing their beliefs. The most active members voicing their beliefs are even derided in print on the Citizen Tinley Park blog with names like cyber bullies and keyboard warriors. In short, Citizen Tinley Park leadership has not created an environment that is inviting to as, to as a wide spectrum as possible, but rather they will provoke emotional responses or personal attacks from other posters rather than civil discussion. They encourage taunting by like-minded users will just try and, and promote dumbing you down if you disagree with them. Mr. Mayor, Michael Fitzgerald and Ken Shaw are on a political agenda and will not stop at nothing to get their way. Sir, these are your hand-picked appointees that are mentioned in the federal lawsuit. Mr. Fitzgerald boasts that he has lawyers salivating to pro bono for him if he got sued. What kind of respect and responsibility does Mr. Fitzgerald portray for his appointment and position by bragging publicly about getting sued? I exercise some free choice and through my support to Michael Glatz and Steve Eberhardt. Immediately, I was chastised for that. Many users don't feel as free as I do to debate or argue with Mr. Fitzgerald or Mr. Shaw. That's because of the, both of these individuals deceitly confound users by seemingly acting for their official citizen to the park capacity while making posts, having no connection to their official capacity. These two self-serving individuals will stop at nothing to gain power. Ken Shaw PM me last night and asked, what do you think about dolphin vaginas? I don't know if he's into mammal pornography or what. What kind of public servant tries provoking citizens and by sending out a sick, twisted comment like that? Ken Shaw is a staggering, is a man staggering around to find his identity. And he's one of your appointees, Mr. Mayor. So if I was you, Mr. Mayor, I would keep a close eye on Michael Fitzgerald and Ken Shaw. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, real quick. Um, since uh, the whole text amendment thing is now back in play. Thanks a lot for that, by the way. Uh, but actually, no, seriously, thank you, because um, I'm revisiting it with new eyes. And um, kind of made some pointed comments at the last meeting. I'd like to apologize for Paul and Stephanie for maybe pointing a little too much. <laughs> but I'd also like to thank them for being good sports about it, and they seriously now, you want to talk about hardworking employees. These guys are trying, they're doing the Lord's work here, digging through that code and trying to fix it. And they were gracious enough to offer me, and Lucas, <laughs> um, uh, a little bit of a tour, I guess, of the, uh, you know, the planning department and, and kind of how all the whole system works. And I really look forward to uh, learning more about it. Um, you know exactly how this process uh, goes from beginning to end and of course the, the the famous whiteboard and when things go on it and all of that and I missed you Jake at that part but anyways <laughs> no by the time I had gone up and uh, you know I, I was I was bringing up something as to the process of the text amendments I think you'd already left but uh, um, you know I thought of you when the whiteboard and all that stuff came up and how this all goes through but uh, I just wanted to thank Paula and Stephanie for their time and in inviting us uh, very gracious employees, and uh, I hope to have 
more information for the next meeting uh, from what I learned from them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ladies first, okay. <laughs> I, I probably would have. Uh, my name is Mary Gritzenbach and I live in Eagle's Nest. Um, yes. For 16 years I was the president of um, District 230's support staff. I would like to suggest after hearing everybody talk about um, four minutes. At um, open school board meetings, they're recorded. You are not answered at the meeting. You will get an answer the following meeting. Thus, if um, you have a question, you had to write it and submit it. You could ask it, but it had to be in written and submitted. You also had to submit your name prior to the board meeting so that you could speak. I think this might help with your four minutes where people have questions, bring them to you, and then the next meeting they can spend four minutes asking you what your an why, about your answer. It's just a suggestion you might want to look into. No, I think other towns have done that as well. And it's, I know, um, you know. I've been to Oak Lawn a couple of meetings with the board there when I was negotiating contracts. Um, they all did it too. They, everybody, every place I went, they always asked you to submit your questions in writing. And then the next meeting, you could you know, say, hey, I don't understand your answer or whatever pops into their head you know, after you give them an answer. Sure. But if you record these meetings, I don't know if you do or not. Yes, we do. You have it right there, and that gives you two weeks to answer somebody again. OK, well, thank you for the suggestion. Yes, sir. Earlier it was mentioned that the 2.5% raise was basically due to inflation. Is that what I heard up here? And I, I think say that was the amount of inflation. You, 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 it's well. Let me let me, let me kind of tell you something. Just in the whole schedule, I think inflation's lower. What it, what they came up with is the recommendation was based on what police and fire got, what the um, public works people got, and what the. So it doesn't it's, have it's anything. It's a combination to do with of a couple different things. It, it's not. It's not just looking at the uh, consumer price index, which was lower than that. It's. Yeah, I was going to say because I certainly didn't get any raise in my social security. You, so. sh I, if I understand right, well, I'm, I'm getting out of my realm. I'm not even going to. But, but I, I think you're supposed to get a cola in social security, but they changed the formula of how it happens and when it happens. No, they didn't change right. it yet. So yeah. who knows? Yeah. But. I want to make sure I understand something. We're going to, are you going to have another meeting for the TIF prior, TIF 101, I guess, is what you refer to it as, prior to the July meeting? Yes, that's the objective. Okay. Yes. OK, because I, I have questions, a lot of questions, actually, but I don't understand why we have Tinley Park High School in the TIF, OK? And we've talked about this before. Why are we in the TIF going to pay for demoing Panduit? And the same with ABC. Why should we be picking up those costs? And then also, if I'm not mistaken, the way the TIF works, you have the AV, right? And anything above the AV goes into the TIF. But if the property values don't increase in that area where the TIF is, then you have nothing going into the, right. into the TIF. But you're going to issue bonds based on the assumption that you will have money brought into the TIF. Is that correct? There's no funding discussion that's even occurred yet about how you do, how you finance it. We could fund it. You know, there's just just other ways you can fund it other than a bond. Okay. Well, that's some of the questions that I have, and I'd really love to hear some answers. No, not don't. here. But uh, I understand that. No, if, please if, come to the. Meeting. If you care to come by, uh, and join us during the day, we'll cover every one of those. Your assumption, your last assumption on bonds being issued based upon TIF revenues, <laughs> is a proper assumption. Doesn't mean we'll do it, but that is one of the options that exists under the law. You're right. This this government has never, never 
issued bonded debt that didn't have a revenue stream where we felt that, that it would pay for it. And to show you that we do it, we've never had anything in default on that. We've always done it. But please, come on in, and Brad will also be uh, part of that, we'll, and, and we'll discuss that, as well as the assistant manager that, uh, well, he used to, so we'll see if a new one is, is going to do it. But at any rate, you're very welcome, and this, it isn't as complicated as we sometimes make it sound. Okay. So do I need to make a phone call to Village? Or we to can you? talk afterwards. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Kevin, I want to thank you, Trustee Suggs. Obviously, you're one of the trustees who follow certain Facebook threads for getting involved in, apparently, there's a lot of people complaining about traffic in this town. You jumped on that, and I'll just leave it as a rhetorical question, knowing that other trustees followed these threads. Why wasn't it the trustee in charge of public safety? I want to comment on something that the clerk and I talked about probably about a month or two ago, and I think it's appropriate with the appointments to committees and committees tonight. About two, or, about two months ago, I emailed Clerk Ray, and I questioned him why the notices of the Crime Prevention Committee meetings and the agendas were not placed on the Village website like all the others. So it took him about a couple of weeks to get back to me. Quite frankly, I was rather shocked. And he says, well, there hasn't been a meeting in over two and a half years. So now you gentlemen are appointing new members to the committee. They haven't had a meeting in two and a half years, and you just see the complaints about people that have about little things like traffic, people's homes being egged, people's homes being damaged. I don't think there's any question that crime prevention is a very important aspect of police work. And I don't think there's any question that citizen involvement in crime prevention is also an important thing. But two and a half years, no meetings. Years ago, going back to 2012, volunteers spent probably two or three hundred hours trying to reinitiate, reinvigorate, whatever you want to call it, the neighborhood watch. It never got done because the people in charge, quite frankly, sabotaged it. I think there's a group of people out here now who would like that. I think there'd be a lot of involvement, and I think it's appalling that for two and a half years there's absolutely no meetings of crime prevention because that is a big concern of people in this town. You gentlemen forwarded to me the crime statistics for 2015. I don't even know if anybody really paid attention to these things. The index crimes, I mean, these are major crimes for people that aren't that familiar with it. In 2015, there were six rapes in Tinley Park, and there was one arrest. I don't know if anybody ever remembers reading anything in the newspaper that this information is published or made available. There were 12 robberies and three arrests. 37 aggravated batteries and 16 arrests. 81 burglaries and eight arrests. You know, nosy neighbors prevent burglaries. The police can't do it on their own. They need the nosy neighbors. Eight arrests out of 81 home burglaries. That is appalling. 581 thefts, 217 arrests. 16 motor vehicle thefts, one arrest. Two arsons, no arrests. You gentlemen just appointed a new committee we have a trustee in charge of public safety who normally goes to those meetings. I would ask, with your appointment, you reinitiate those meetings, you reinitiate Neighborhood Watch, and you help these people out here, help the police department, cut down the crime, and make arrests, for God's sakes. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'd like to start out by uh, reiterating a request I had submitted uh, probably two to three months ago now, and that's just to um, encourage the board to be more clear in your language with these agenda items. And we have three uh, agenda items here tonight related to the TIFs. Two of them were supplemental. I've tried really hard to try and understand them. I mean, can I just have a show of hands here in the room? 
I mean, did anybody else understand those two supplemental agenda items? Did anybody? N not, even the, not even the attorney in the room understood the two supplemental items here on the tips. I mean, how, how can we intelligently comment when we don't even know what the heck you're talking about? I'll defer to counsel so. on that one because these are legal requirements that have to be met. <clears throat> Sure. The, the standard on an agenda is you have to reasonably inform the public of the action that's going to be taken. Um, I, I can tell you that these agendas are, since I've been here, they're, I, I think they're actually quite detailed. And I agree. Could, could we all could we do better on certain items? Sure. But, but I think this meets that standard. And I would say, you know, the, the amount of information that's put on this village's agenda is, I, I would say, more than most towns would be my my read, but can, can we do better? Do, yeah, I, th I think staff's always trying to, you know, inform the public of what we're voting on. Okay. I, I think we need plainer language. Uh, regarding the TIFs, it seems like there's a lot of salesmanship going on or a lot of selling, not really necessarily uh, objective information providing. I mean, you say that, well, you know, that the Panduit won't really benefit at our expense, but I mean, really, although they might not directly benefit, there are going to be indirect benefits, and those are benefits. And in this relationship with the TIFs, it's the taxpayers who are rolling the dice. There's no risks um, for the people who have plenty. Also, too, on the TIFs, I want to remind you, too, that. I mean, it's nearly a quarter century of a break. And it can easily turn into a third of a century of a break once the TIF is over and it's extended. Seems like the Village Board is always happy to give breaks for those who have plenty. Those breaks are, are numerous. But whenever there's uh, breaks to be considered for those who don't have plenty, wow, look at the scrutiny come out. I mean, contrast that with the attitude, Mayor, that you displayed at the May business meeting, you know, when you were commemorating the captains of industry here in Tinley Park, when you decided to go off script, go out of your way, to talk disparagingly of a suggestion that was brought up by a resident here during the public comments, regarding discounts or waivers for the poor, regarding fees on permits and inspections, or to consider basing it on ability to pay. You chose to make some disparaging comments. And I think it's especially relevant, Mayor, because, I mean, you're currently named as the defendant in a lawsuit in which one of the areas of concern is your inadequate consideration of helping out low-income people. And the taxpayers, Mr. Mayor, they're on the hook for defending you. Is that correct? Am I, is that correct? I'll let Beagle answer that one. We're, we're not, we're not going to discuss that lawsuit. I, not, not, no, no, I'm not asking you to discuss the lawsuit. I'm asking, who ends up paying for the attorneys to defend the mayor? The taxpayers are on the hook for they're, that. They're, correct? There's insurance and there's things like that. Yes. Okay, right. So, Mr. Mayor, I think maybe you should have stayed on script instead of going off script and going out of your way to disparage low-income people. I think you need there to be responsible no, to the There was no taxpayers. disparaging and of income, yes, low-income people. No, you're mistaken. You're taking things out of context, as you often do. You came up with a no, suggestion at this meeting, at this forum, about having essentially fees based on your ability to pay. And I said, well, good, do you want to show me your income tax statement? And you just kind of, you know, you, you, you felt uncomfortable with that. That didn't happen. Understand, well, maybe you play a videotape because I'm sure they're there. Um, what I would also suggest you consider that for the one tax break that you get, everybody else pays. That's the way it works. Which your tax fees, break? Your fees, no, you wanted a discount on fees, permit fees in particular. Permit fees are based on the cost of service. So if you pull a fee for a mailbox, there's a $50 charge that goes with that. 
That's basically our cost of sending an inspector out to the home where it's being installed to take a look at it. That's what it is. So if you pay $10 instead of $50, somebody else here, take a look to your left and your right, pays that other 40. That's the way fees are set. That's a requirement of state law, and that's the way we do it. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, are you going to retract your statement and the substance of it when you were talking about that? Or would you care to go ahead and reiterate those disparaging comments that you I made about people? I just gave you the disparaging people? comment about your concept and your idea. You didn't seem to be able to, to put any meat around it. All you did was comment that there was a disparaging remark about low-income people. There's, I've never made a disparaging remark about low-income people. I made a comment about a, what I think is a bad idea. Yeah, you did. Your bad idea. You, you did. You did make a, a, a disparaging comment, and it reflects, Mayor, on your dislike for people who are poor. And here we are, Mr. Mayor. You're in a lawsuit, Mr. Mayor. You're representing our village. If you have issues with the poor people, Mr. Mayor, if you have issues with people who are struggling, trying to pay taxes via a low income, then maybe you need to start spending some of your money on a psychologist to deal with your issues, your phobia, and your hatred. Shape up, Mayor, or resign. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, well. uh, I can't let this pass. And I mean this. Direct assaults upon any of us. We're elected. You know, that can come. I think you better look at this man's background. He has spent his life in support of low income families. He has worked for every. Ah! Uh, look! Hey! What kind of comment was that? Send it to the judge. Give me a little help here. Explain to us what these comments mean. You go ahead and explain your off-the-script off comment you made. I didn't make any. We move on, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Other villages have considered people's ability to pay just move on. It's way out of order. We're way out of order. Thank you. I appreciate your comment. Thank you, Mr. Hess. I think in defense of what just went on, I think the mayor handled himself very accordingly, very professionally in that regard while dealing with direct assaults. I do believe with one of the other members who had come up here who indicated that having your public comments written out in advance is probably a better way to organize your thoughts and ideas when presenting them before the board. It gives you an opportunity to reflect a little bit on exactly what's going on. I know I'm the president of the Tinley Park JCs. We've met with the mayor about certain things inside of our community that he's looking to do, as well as we're looking to do to help highlight this community and the greatness within it. So I think you need to look at some of those things in context to this bigger picture, just saying. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> One last question. Certainly. Mr. Niemeyer, you know. Any updates? <laughs> what was the question? I assume you're, you're talking about the Cook County Sheriff, right? There you go. Um, no, I do not have any updates from, from last time. As I, I had talked to them a couple weeks ago, but we have not. I don't have any updates compared to two weeks ago. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to second Mike uh, Suckley's suggestion to keep an eye on Mike Fitzgerald and Ken Shaw uh, because they're going to do some really good things for Tinley Park. That's all. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, I would. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to move uh, to adjourn to executive session to address the purchase or lease of real property for the use of the public body, including meetings held for the purpose of discussing whether a particular parcel should be acquired, B, litigation, whether an action against affecting or on behalf of the particular public body has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, 
or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting. May I have such a motion, please? Second. Second. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Roll call on adjournment to executive session. Trustee Maher. Yay. Trustee Grady. Yay. Trustee Panito. Yes. Trustee Vandenberg. Yep. Trustee Yunker. Yes. Trustee Suggs. Yes. Motion carried. Uh, we're not expecting any announcements after the end of this session, so um, yeah. you're more than free to hang around if you'd like, but. Uh,